Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased today to be speaking with Dr. Amy Paith about her book titled The American Poet Laureate, A History of U.S. Poetry and the State, published by Columbia University Press. This book does a really interesting examination of the American Poet Laureate and reveals that the state, the government of the United States, is actually probably a lot more part of the story than we probably think. Um, The book combines sort of looking at the Poet Laureate in more modern times, more recently, as well as historically and helping us understand that these two things are probably not nearly as separate um, as that dichotomy I've just falsely set up. So Amy, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast to tell us about your book. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be on the podcast. Well, we're very happy to have you, and I'd love to ask you to start off, please, by introducing yourself a little bit and explain why you decided to write this book. Sure. My name is Amy Paith, and I'm a lecturer in critical writing at the Marx Family Center for Excellence in Writing at the University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia. Uh, I am a literary historian, and I have broad-ranging interests in American literature and culture, but most of my research so far is focused on the role of American poetry in American culture since World War II. And I'm also interested in more historical and archival and even sociologically inflected approaches to literature, which leads me to why I wrote Uh, why I wrote this book. Um, So this is my first monograph, The American Poet Laureate, and it's the first full history of the National Poetry Office in the United States and explores, as you said, uh, the under-recognized and I argue central role of the state in American poetic production after World War II. Um, As for um, my motivations to to writing the book. So um, I wrote the book for a few reasons. At first, I should say it's based in research that I conducted while I was completing my PhD. And during my graduate studies, um, I found that so much of the scholarship in my field, um, poetry criticism, was implicitly and sometimes explicitly something of an advocacy project. Um, I think maybe there's You know, the distinction between scholarship and criticism is a challenge or more of a challenge when one is writing about contemporary authors, as in my field. Um, There can be a tendency to advocate for and to take sides. And I really did not want to produce scholarship that advocated for a certain type of poetry or study so-called great poems. Um, And... In the U.S., there's also a lot of um, disagreement about what should be considered great poems. Um, I really wanted to see the whole field. And so I began taking this more archival and historical approach. Um, And I found that when telling the story of American poetry after World War II, and especially its, its infighting, its divisions, I found that institutions were often more reliable narrators than individuals. Um... So in other words, I became more interested or at least just as interested in institutions uh, than in individual poets. And as I began studying the institutions that shaped post-World War II poetry in the U.S., I kept coming back to my research, kept leading me back to the state, meaning quite literally the federal government and its role in shaping poetic culture. Um, I began undertaking research at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., and the National Poetry Office, um, now called the Poet Laureateship, what this book is about, um, was an understudied um, example of the role of the state, and it became a lens for me through which I could understand the broader role of the state in American poetic production. Um, So, yeah, I guess to sum up, or like the short version of that answer is that I found I really loved archival research Mm -hmm. and that um, following the paper trails, not just the poems, was giving me a clearer historical picture of the field of American poetry. Love that. Love when someone goes into the archives and is like, oh, wait, look at this story. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Thank you for giving us that introduction to the work. Um, 
I'd love to kind of start off picking up on something you mentioned, right? It's called Poet Laureate now, but it used to be called something else. So can you take us kind of to the beginning? What was this position called and what was it a bit, you know, not before it was what we know it is today? Absolutely. Yes. So the position, what what today is called the Poet Laureate, was established in the 1930s. Um, it was established by a private trust Um Donor Archer Huntington executed a deed of trust, and it provided this position in perpetuity to the Library of Congress. And at this time, the post was called the Consultant in Poetry to the Library of Congress. It was first held by Joseph Oslander in 1937, and um, it wouldn't be called the Poet Laureateship for 50 more years. Um, so when this position started out as consultant in poetry, this was not a public facing or a nationally representative role. It really was more like a fancy librarianship. Um, the poets who occupied the office in these early years, they, they did things like, uh, you know, survey the poetry holdings of the library. They corresponded with authors to secure gifts like of books or manuscripts and occasionally they might respond to reference questions from patrons so like everyday citizens in poetry book clubs or literary groups although those types of inquiries at the time they were considered pretty bothersome and tedious like <laughs> part of the job um, so you know really at this time what what poets were doing as consultants were enjoying their stipend and the social life of Washington, D.C. Um, and given their li limited responsibilities, fairly limited responsibilities, um, they kind of used their free time just to work on their own poetry. Um, over time, the position would change, which I'm sure we'll get into. And this, these changes especially happened during the Cold War. Yes, no, we're definitely going to talk about the changes, <laughs> um, but good to know kind of what we're starting with, because um, I certainly didn't realize that that's where kind of the Poet Laureate came from. It's so different to what we think of now. Um, so good to have that kind of before so we can talk about the changes. But before we do that, um, can I ask you to talk a little bit about how you traced the changes? So can you tell us about your methodological priorities and theoretical convictions for the book and how you came up with them? Absolutely. Um, what I found, I've touched a bit on this um, already in talking about why I was driven to write the book, but what I found in my field was um, there was a lack of attention to institutions um, and especially the actual mechanics of cultural production. Um, so there are studies of post-war American poetry that do take more sociological approaches or are um, more interested in institutions, um, but primarily they still focus on poetry communities or coteries, not really like the nuts and bolts of how poetry is funded and how it's received. So again, the actual mechanics of cultural production. And it's my contention in the book that to understand American poetry, we, we have to not only read poems. We have to understand the world around those poems. So um, I do read poems in the book, I should say, but I, I also read archival records. So I follow the paper trail of major institutions in the field. And I also find it really important to follow individuals who are not just the poets, but who are administrators and secretaries, prize coordinators, IRS employees, university librarians, all these sort of middlemen in the work of cultural production. These, I, I believe, are really important actors. And similarly, in choosing my objects of study, you know, my, my source material, I insist in the book on reading what might seem at first like dry records, you know, memoranda and tax documents and secretarial correspondence, also letters you know, between poets, but also between poets and government administrators or prize administrators. So I see these paper trails as a historian, as, as a literary historian, as important, again, to understanding poetry or as important to understanding poetry as the poems themselves. Um, so, you know, this means I focus less than some of my, you know, some other scholars 
do on close readings of poems or focused attention on individual authors. Um, But this leaves me room to highlight individuals who have kind of been lost to um, the story. So for example, I talk in the book about poetry office secretary Phyllis Armstrong, who kind of ran the, effectively ran the office of the National um, Poet for decades. You know, she was there much longer than poets who served one or two year terms. And she did things like set the schedule of events for the library, manage poets' recordings, um, typed out, and often herself would prepare the content of poets' annual reports. Um, so those are the types of, types of actors I focus on um, and methodologically insist on. Um, that's a bit about methodology. Uh, I would also say here the broader argument of the book or contention of the book is, um, you know, the state is really just kind of confoundingly under-examined. Um, I, I, it's, it's this kind of silent center, this engine of American poetry after World War II. And um, there's a widely held understanding that institutions of higher education are really important to American poetic production, um, but less has been said about what funded those programs, which is primarily the state. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a great, um, gives me a great thing to ask about because it is the state I'd like to turn to next. You have a term in the book that I think is really helpful for, um, fleshing out kind of what you've told us so far, you know, we've got the contention. All right, let's see how we got there. Can you tell us what you mean by state verse culture and how it shows up in this early pre title of poet laureate context? State verse culture is a a type of a riff on poet and critic Charles Bernstein's term, official verse culture. Um, An official verse culture, Bernstein's term, it refers to um, dominant mainstream or conventional forms of poetry that are promoted by large publishing houses and academic institutions and prominent literary awards. So he's critiquing with this term poetry that's easily accessible and marketable, um, commodifiable, conforms to conventional literary standards and kind of neglects more avant-garde or marginalized voices. Um, By state verse culture, I am calling attention to the role of the state in creating this poetic mainstream that Bernstein, Bernstein critiques. So state verse culture, I'm describing um, really the same, again, poetic mainstream, but how the state is this central arbiter, um, cooperating public and private interests, the the public and private interests that motor poetic production, and thinking about the interests of the state um, in these mainstream ideas of American poetry. So for example, the the individual voice um, is a kind of American value that um, would become valuable to to the state during the Cold War and, and beyond. And the groundwork for state verse culture was laid in the years immediately following World War II, I found in my research. So institutions like the Library of Congress, Poetry Magazine, Yale University, and private and corporate donors like Lilly Pharmaceutical, um, these, were, these were all um, cooperating interests even then. Um, In the book, I look at four sets of institutions. So government institutions, firstly, uh, literary institutions, educational institutions, and then private donors. So these sort of are the four sets of actors that make up state versus culture and configure the dominant values and dominant tastes in American poetry. And again, the the kind of argument is that the state is the center of this, uh, the center of this nexus. Um, And we can really see see, um, state versus culture become a kind of recognizable um, phenomenon in American poetry by uh, the 1960s, early 1960s, and it becomes dominant in, in the 1990s. All right. I'm definitely going to ask you about those, but 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 before we get there, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to stay 
maybe in that post-war period with this nexus of actors that you've just helpfully laid out for us, um, something that seems, I mean, at least reading it, it seemed pretty dramatic happened in 1949 to configure or reconfigure the relationship between these different actors um, in terms of kind of the the post of Poet Laureate and this idea of some sort of, I guess, maybe figurehead or nexus or locus um, of this idea of state versus culture. What's happening at this point? Yeah, in in 1949, um, this was a, a really crucial year for the office and to the story in my book. So in 1949, there was a set of scandals at the Library of Congress. The first had to do with a prize. So um, in 1949, Robert Lowell was Poet Laureate. Again, then he was called the consultant in poetry. And he, along with what was called the Fellows in American Letters, Uh, which was a committee, Um, he sat on this um, to award the first Bollingen Prize, um, a prize in American poetry. Um, And it was the first time this prize was being awarded. It's still known today as one of the most prestigious awards in American poetry, maybe even American letters today. Um, And the prize was, the scandal was this. So the prize was awarded to Ezra Pound for his book, The Peas and Cantos. And Pound um, was an experimental modernist poet who also was infamous for um, fascist radio and anti-Semitic radio broadcasts uh, during the war out of Italy. He um, was imprisoned. considered a traitor. And um, at the time the award was being uh, decided, he was incarcerated at St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital. Um, So a kind of unruly character, uh, what happened on the committee to decide this award was a kind of can you separate the art from the artists debate. Um, So, you know, they, they decided, yes, we can celebrate uh, the poetry, even if we don't agree with the poet's ideological values. Um, so he wins the award, Pound wins the award, and this just prompted kind of a culture war at the time. Uh, tons of negative reactions in the media. The New York Times ran um, a headline on it in its front page, um, Pound in Mental Clinic wins prize for poetry penned in treason cell. Um, you know, it really scandalized people. Everyday citizens would write, wrote to their um, congressmen and senators upset about the award because, um, you know, it had been, it was actually privately endowed, but um, had been decided by this organ of the government, this, um, these fellows in American letters. So what happened is the government sort of threw up their hands. They said, okay, you know, you're right. This was a big mistake. And in fact, it's not the government's business at all to be making judgments in what they called matters of taste. Um, That in a free democratic American society, right, the government shouldn't have anything to do with artistic judgment and all of these messy politics. So they abolished the award. They said, we'll never even grant any award, right, determining what is good poetry again. They even discontinued similar art or other awards in the arts, like for chamber music, other awards that the library administered. And the library would not administer literary or artistic prizes for another 40 years. Um, The award was moved to, by the way, Yale University, um, although it was bid for by both Poetry Magazine and Yale uh, to take over the award. It's still administered by Yale today. And as a sort of side note, I would say, you know, Yale taking over the administration of the award really foreshadows um, the importance of universities in um, American poetry in the years to come. But the other scandal um, that I want to mention in this period, it's a few years after 1949. So in in 1952, um, another modernist poet, um, William Carlos Williams, was appointed to the National Poetry Office um, to be be the consultant. And um, this was kind of the McCarthy years. So he was effectively red-baited out of the office. 
Um, again, citizens writing in, you know, s- scandalized, you know, why, why is this um, potential communist um, going to be in a government sanctioned position. So together, you know, what these scandals meant, the scandals with Pound and then with Williams, um, was that the government really wanted to wash its hands of all this ugly business of um, making judgments in the arts. And um, yeah, you know, constituents weren't happy with what, at least in the public eye, was government funded prize in, you know, going to a fascist or a government um post going to a communist. So what happened is the poetry office ended up sitting vacant for the next four years. So in the mid-50s, from 1952 to 1956, there was no consultant in poetry. In some ways, maybe the story would have stopped there, right? Tried the experiment, didn't work. Office is empty, prize is gone. We're, you know, nothing more to see here. Um, but of course, by saying it's empty for four years implies that at some point it stops being empty. Mm-hmm. So what happens to the position at the end of the 1950s? Yeah, at the end of the 50s is really when it uh, was recharged. And um, yeah, so uh, really the answer to your question is Robert Frost. <laughs> um, so Robert Frost, um, who maybe is more of a household name, um, if a poet can be a household name, um, was appointed to uh, the position of consultant in 1958. And Robert Frost represented a kind of opposite pole from the um, fascist, communist, kind of scandalous, modernist poets of um, Pound and um, Williams and these scandals uh, a decade before. Uh, in fact, he had expressed outrage um, when Pound was awarded the Bollingen Prize in 1949. Um, he represented uh, quite intentionally, I would say, too. He really represented this very strategically and intentionally, a kind of down-home American image of himself. You know, he was a farmer from New England, and he frequently wrote about settings from rural life. So he had this kind of homespun, all-American, regional, approachable um, persona. And again, I would say this is, um, you know, he had an agenda with this. Um, He was... Um, kind of in his sunset years when he was appointed and um, coming into the office very late in life, he really loved the idea of um, kind of having, you know, proximity to power. And he really believed um, that um, poetry had to do with national values and wanted to reclaim this role for American poetry and American life. And he was quite, quite successful in this. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think he definitely counts as a household name, um, which makes it so interesting to kind of see him come into this role, given the the drama you've told us about leading up to it. Um, can we talk about the Cold War at this point? If we're now at the end of the 1950s, going into the 60s, we've got someone who's interested in power, who's known already for communicating. What role did this reconfigured poetry office play in terms of the U.S. efforts in the Cold War um, abroad, as well as kind of what it means for the government to work domestically as well. Absolutely. So um, through Frost, I mean, really, I would say he motored this. The National Poetry Office itself became more important as a kind of representative voice of the citizen. Um, so again, Frost is the national poet in 1958 to 1959. And after, um, his appointment, um, he sort of stayed on as a consultant in the arts, um, and gives us a front view to these new, to new investments of the state in the arts, um, and in poetry. Um, um, so, for example, he performs as 
the first uh, inaugural poet at Kennedy's inauguration in 1961. So the U.S. didn't have an inaugural poet before this. Um, and then the following year, he was um, sent by the State Department on a mission to Moscow um, and actually met with Khrushchev and gave readings in various cities around the Soviet Union. Um, so um, this gives us a clue to um, the way, like Frost's role, both domestically at you know the inauguration and abroad um, in Moscow, um, gives us a clue to how the U.S. federal government was thinking about artists um, during the Cold War. It really increased its investment in the creative arts um, from the late '50s to to the early '60s, and the Kennedy administration was crucial in this. They placed a new and a special value in the symbolic power of the American artist. And there's, you know, exchanges to letters um, and telegrams between Kennedy and Frost, where they talk about um, poetry and, and power. And um, again, the poet is sort of this proxy citizen, right? This representative citizen uh, representing the, you know, freedom and individuality to the rest of the world. Um, so under the Kennedy administration, they really expanded their cultural and missions abroad um, beyond just uh, Frost and the National Poetry Office. Um, the Today, the National Endowment um, for the Arts, for example, this actually wasn't established until 1965, but the, the groundwork for, for it was laid under the Kennedy, Kennedy administration. So really, this, this period is where the government now is a friend to the arts again, um, or the idea that the government could be a friend to the arts became more appropriate in this Kennedy time period. Um, meanwhile, though, the state was also learning how to partner with other, you know, with private organizations and to advance national agendas through private and semi-private networks. Um, so, for example, creative writing programs um, was a way also to promote the free individual American voice. Yeah, no. Can you tell us more about the creative writing programs, um, especially kind of if we go back to this idea of the nexus and the different actors? You talk about creative writing programs in universities. You talk about them in terms of industry. You talk obviously about the role of the state what's happening with the development of these programs and especially the interactions between these different actors? Yeah, this is such an important question. Um, so, I mean, as scholars have shown in my field very well now, um, beginning with Mark McGraw's The Program Era, creative writing programs exploded uh, in the late 20th century. Um, and they had far-reaching, even almost totalizingly shaped the literary la landscape um, of post-war American literature. So, um, again, what these accounts of the creative writing industry don't often talk about is how the, the programs were funded, um, which, again, is by the state. And the state funded the creative writing industry as kind of part of an ideological Cold War effort Um explicitly, but also covertly. So in the book, I, the main example I talk about um, is probably the most famous creative writing program in the U.S., or prestigious anyway, the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Um, Paul Engel, who ran the Iowa Writers' Workshop from 1941 to 1965, was a really savvy fundraiser. And in... Um, the 40s and 50s, he was primarily just appear, a, appealing to corporate and individual donors. Um, so he received grants, for example, from the Rockefeller Foundation in the 50s. And the way he appealed to these corporate and individual donors was using a kind of Cold War lingo. Um, he talked about the threat of ideolo ideological indoctrination um, from the Soviet Union, how there was a the University of Moscow was accepting exchange students um, for writing programs, and the U.S. needed to have their own, you know, writing programs. He talked about the living voice of the artist as the image by which a country sees itself and the image by which other countries are going to, to see it as well. 
So we really have this idea of the writer as the, and um, indeed the poet as the unfettered, free, democratic expression of indi- American individuality contra the Soviet Union in his um, appeals to funders. They were successful. Um, the program was doing really well. And then in the 60s, early 60s, um, Paul Engel began getting support from the state directly. Um, with support of the State Department in 1963, for example, he uh, went on kind of a world recruiting tour, um, especially traveling traveling through um, East and South Asia. Um, and this laid the groundwork for the founding of Iowa's International Writing Program in 1967. And when the international program at Iowa was founded, it was subsidized by the State Department, but also um, the Asia Foundation, which is which was a nonprofit international development organization whose goal was to promote open societies, democratic societies in Asia, and the Farfield Foundation, which was a CIA front and funded cultural operations through the Congress of Cultural Freedom. Um, the, the CCF, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, was an anti-communist organization founded in 1950 and was, you know, its goal was just to promote Western liberal values and counteract the influence of communism in intellectual and cultural circles during the Cold War. Um, so that's sort of what's happening in the creative writing industry. Um, and I would say, too, um, you know, I just mentioned the CCF. Meanwhile, it was um, beyond the creative writing industry, uh, was doing a lot in the global Cold War to fund poets um, who were increasingly useful as cultural missionaries abroad. So um, some of my research looks at correspondence between um, prior consultants in poetry, prior national poets, uh, Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell, where, you know, they have these exchanges where they're like, I'm going to stop in Trinidad or Lima. And, you know, like they're just being funded by the CCF and they're like, you know, I think I know someone in Rio who's going to get us more funds from the CCF. And there's one telling letter where Elizabeth Bishop asks Robert Lowell, who pays for the Congress of Cultural Freedom anyway? <laughs> you know, she's like wondering about it. And I, again, it's, you know, I guess, unbeknownst to them, a CIA friend. <laughs> what a really interesting way uh, to learn about, I mean, for me, coming not from creative writing, uh, to learn about kind of those aspects to it. And fascinating as well to hear that kind of even people embedded in it were like, wait, where is the money coming from? Mm-hmm. So thank mm-hmm. you for taking us through that piece of the kind of Cold Warrior aspect. Can you maybe help us understand um, another element. Obviously, the Cold War stuff is somewhat less relevant to today. But if I could ask you about another kind of way in which the poet laureateship um, and all of this sort of state-funded poetry stuff evolved in ways that are still incredibly what we have now, when, how, why did we get this whole national poetry project thing? And how did that become such a big part of what it meant to be poet laureate? Yes, this is a really important new stage of the office and continues into today. So the way we think about the Poet Laureate now in the U.S. is um, someone who um, is really, first of all, I would say projecting an idea of nation more so than we saw in the early years of the office, but also now Poets Laureate tend to have poetry projects, um, public facing kind of activist programs that they run um, through the Library of Congress during their time in office. And this started in the early 1990s and is uh, very connected to the Cold War history we just talked about. So poet laureate Joseph Brodsky um, was um, Poet Laureate in 1991 to 1992. And just in this one year of term, it was very, very influential. Um, I would say precisely because Brodsky was a Russian emigre 
he had been expelled from the Soviet Union in 1972. He had even served um, time in prison um, doing hard labor when he was still in the Soviet Union. So he was a really interesting choice as poet laureate during these very years the Cold War is, you know, supposedly or formally ending. You know, he took office in September 1991, in fact, three years, excuse me, three months before um, the Soviet Union dissolved in de- December. So um, what was really interesting about this choice is this Russian emigre becomes, Brodsky becomes a proselytizer of poetry as a vehicle for American values. He praised in the English language as quote unquote the best in one of his first press conferences as poet laureate. He believed that poetry could be this bastion of an enlightened democracy. And he, importantly to your question, he initiated the first poetry project as we know them today. So he, his project was to distribute volumes of poetry in um, public places and spaces like airports or hotel rooms. He wanted, you know, books of poetry to be all around kind of like, um, I don't know if you guys have this in the UK, but Gideon Bibles also always used to be in the, um, you know, nightstands of hotel rooms. He kind of wanted poetry to be like that, to, to spread it all around. And this project wasn't actually very successful itself, but it became a kind of template for these public facing and public reaching poetry projects that Poets Laureate, most public Poets Laureate have undertaken since. Um, so he kind of laid, laid the template for, for future projects. Um, Robert Pinsky, Billy Collins, Ted Kuzer are some of the poets in the 1990s and, and aughts who, um, ran these public facing projects, which I can talk more about if you'd like. Uh, what I will say about them to begin with is that they had certain values. So they really established as their primary values, standard American English, um, you know, rather than multilingual um, poetry, for example, they really championed values like the populist accessibility of poetry. So poetry that is not too difficult or hard to understand and the individual voice and individualism. Um, and also the individual spoken voice was really important to Pinsky's project. Um, so in other words, I would just say these, these, at least these first projects like in the 1990s and 2000s that defined the position of poet laureate, they were not ones that particularly triumphed marginalized voices, you know, or any less traditional forms of poetry. Hmm. Which goes back to some of what you were saying earlier in terms of state versus culture and kind of the most accessible forms, I suppose, of the form. Can you talk us through, given that that answer has very helpfully, um, told us about the kind of state aspect of it. If we go back to your nexus of actors uh, right from the beginning, what role were private organizations and relationships with private organizations playing into this sort of post-Cold War conception of Poet Laureate? They were playing a really important role. Um, And there's a number of private organizations we could talk about, but I would say the most important one, um, not just a case study, but I would say absolutely the most important private organization during this time period and today in the field of American poetry is the Poetry Foundation. And what happened here is a really interesting story. So in 2002, around the time these projects were getting started and the poet laureateship was becoming more of this public facing role. In 2002, uh, Ruth Lilly, who was the heiress to the fortune of Lilly Pharmaceutical. So this is a pharmaceutical company known for insulin products for diabetes and drugs like the antidepressant Prozac. So it's a, you know, big, big pharma. Um, So this pharmaceutical heiress, Ruth Lilly, donates $100 million to Poetry Magazine. And this was a huge shock to the poetry world. It was even just a shock to the nonprofit world. This was the single largest donation that had ever been made to a nonprofit organization in the U S and, um, kind of a scandal of its own, you know, it took this little magazine, poetry magazine, 
um, when I say little, I mean um, tiny operating staff. It is, you know, maybe the most well-known magazine in the country um, in the field of poetry, but it, it, completely reconstituted um, the operating staff of the Modern Poetry Association at the time, overhauled it into what is now the Poetry Foundation. Um, two pieces of backstory here, if, if I have time, um, that are just kind of interesting mm. anecdotes. Yeah. So um, first of all, Ruth Lilly, the, the pharmaceutical heiress who donated this $100 million, she had submitted her poems in the 1970s to the magazine and um, received really thoughtful re rejection notes um, from the editor at that time. And um, that's just an interesting part of her story, I suppose. Um, I guess she you know, maintained her love for, for the magazine, despite being rejected. It's a good thing she got these nice reject handwritten, like notes from the slush pile for, from her slush pile submissions, or maybe, you know, the hundred million dollar donation would never have been made. And the other piece of backstory goes back even further from the seventies when she submitted those poems, which was in back to 1949, our kind of year of scandal. So around the time of the Bollingen Award fiasco that we talked about, the editor of Poetry Magazine, uh, Hayden Carruth, he had actually written to Ruth Lee's brother asking for support of the magazine. Um, he knew they were doing some, you know, philanthropic efforts and the magazine was in funding trouble and he wrote to um then it was called the the Eli Lilly company and they, they expressed some interest and then ultimately um uh, you know said no we can't give you any money um so there's a huge irony here um you know that this Lily donation was made 50 years kind of too late, at least for that poetry editor. He was actually fired um, a few months after this. Um, he really wasn't doing well, but 50 years later, the, you know, the Lily donation kind of comes back through um, Ruth Lily um, and transforms the magazine. So thanks for letting me kind of go on that detour. <laughs> but, um, no, thank you for telling us. Yeah. But um, what happens is now the, po poetry magazine becomes this kind of huge corporate superpower in the poetry world, you know, if that can exist in the poetry world. Um, th the um, Everyone kind of resigns who's there and John Barr, uh, who is an investment banker and kind of um, poetry hobbyist, was appointed its first president, the first president of the Poetry Foundation in 2004. Um, so just a huge kind of shift in the culture there. And he, Barr talked about how, like, you know, poets should be um, imperialists and importers of experience. And we need to change the mission of poetry to make it much more accessible and populist and reach wider audiences, interact more with mainstream media and primary school classrooms. Um, and also in this time began really supporting the work of the National Poetry Office, began supporting the works of uh, the projects of Poets Laureate. In fact, one of his, the first things John Barr did um, as the new Poetry Foundation president was establish a new award in humor in American poetry um, with a pretty hefty $25,000 purse and awarded it to Poet Laureate Billy Collins. So there was definitely a kind of alliance being drawn between um, the Poetry Foundation and the National Poetry Office. Um, and Ted Kuzer, Poet Laureate from 2004 to 2006, became promptly the first National Poetry Project to benefit from the Poetry Foundation and their new wealth and their new populist mission. Um, so, um, you know, his project had to do with putting um, poems back into newspapers. Um, so again, a kind of populist um, agenda his project provided newspapers and online publications with a free weekly column featuring contemporary American poems. And um, again, that was funded, you know, it was through his post, but it was primarily funded by the Poetry Foundation.
those are some pretty strong links indeed. Um, thank you for taking us through that. We're coming up to, I think, kind of quite obviously the present, just in terms of the years, right? But also in terms of kind of, oh, this is starting to look more recognizable, right? The Poetry Foundation is still a big thing. Um, the mm-hmm. Poet Laureate still does a lot of uh, public facing sorts of things. What do you think are sort of some of the ways that this history you've taken us through uh, helps us understand poetry and politics and state versus culture today? I think it's a really tough question. Um, I would say this, you know, poets of prominence, they do tend to be on the same end of the political spectrum. Um, I think what they disagree about is the poet's responsibility in relationship to opportunities like the laureate position. So does poetry confront and agitate for major social change, you know, on the one hand, or on the other, is it just meant to reflect, even if ever more inclusively, ever more perfectly, ever, ever more multiculturally, you know, American life as it is under direct sponsorship of the state. Um, and the latter, you know, is what the poet laureateship does. You know, it is not a position where you're making waves, right? And, and you, you know, it's not poetry that is seeking major political change, I would say. However, I would also say that my work tells me that even the, the other side of that equation, you know, agitators, they also rely on the network of partnerships that the state has set up. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's important to mention too. And I think of um, Juliana Spar's book in answer to your question as well. Um, Juliana Spar, um, a wonderful critic, argues that, you know, poetry just cannot resist state containment. Like as a genre, it's really hard to do. Um so I don't know. I don't know how um, this arrangement translates into political culture exactly, um, or the culture of the left more broadly, which I'm suggesting most of poetry sits within. Um, that would be really interesting work to do. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're asking me who Biden or Trump, respectively, would appoint to the laureateship, I really won't hazard a oh, guess. Oh goodness, I have no idea. No. <laughs> but I will say, I will say, you know, Trump um, did not have an inaugural poet, for example, um, uh, at his inauguration. Uh, whereas for his presidential inauguration in 2021, you know, Joe Biden uh, had to great, you know, very positively received had Amanda Gorman. Um, Mm-hmm. read um the hill we climb as his inaugural poet um yeah. during that ceremony well i think what this history does help us show is kind of next time we see something like that um we have a better understanding of like wait why is there someone stood up there in something like an inauguration reading a poem um it gives us a better lens to kind of understand what all of that is uh which is quite helpful So thank you very much for taking us through, granted, the highlights version. The book, of course, has way more detail, uh, but at least this version of the book. I only have one question left. Uh, You mentioned this was obviously your first monograph, something you've been working on for quite a long time, but it, it, it is out. It's been out for a little bit. Is there anything you might be thinking of working on next or already working on, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's about poet laureates that you'd like to preview or highlight? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I have a few projects percolating, um, some academic and some non-academic. Um, the, the primary one is an invited monograph from Roman and Littlefield, collecting some of the research I've been doing on something far, not far away from the poetry world, but um, on post-feminism and and American media. Um, That's research I've been meanwhile doing, stemming from classes uh, I've been teaching here at the University of Pennsylvania, um, for example, chiclet and post-feminism. Um, but to be honest, before I turn to to completing this monograph or other projects, I'm kind of taking a moment to just shepherd um, my two babies into the world. So this this book, mm-hmm. and then um, my actual human baby that was born <laughs> two two weeks before this book came out. So those are mm-hmm. those are my, those are my two current <laughs> projects. <laughs> Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, Both of those take rather a lot of work. So best of luck with that. Um, 
And of course, listeners can read the book we've been discussing titled The American Poet Laureate, A History of U.S. Poetry and the State, published by Columbia University Press. Amy, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. It was great to talk with you today.